I'm going to introduce you to this fantastic event that we have in line today with Tom Griever. Um, and this uh, event is particular t talking about how every designer has to justify designs uh, to non-designers, um, yet most lack the ability to explain themselves in a way that is compelling or fosters agreement. The ability to effectively articulate design decisions is critical to the success, success of a project because the most articulate person often wins. So now we're going to join Tom Griever at our Articulating Design Decisions event to learn more um, and improve how you can articulate your own design decisions. So without further ado, Tom, go ahead and take it away. Thanks, Julia. Let me switch and share my screen here. Awesome. Well, thanks everyone uh, so much for coming. I'm excited to talk to you about um, a topic that is of particular interest and, and passion to me. Obviously, I wrote a book on the topic, uh, which probably says a lot, but um, you know, this journey for me uh, started uh, a long time ago in my career. Um, I've, been, I've been leading uh, designers and design teams for uh, many years. Um, but when I, when I interviewed designers uh, for a role on my team, I always ask them the question in the interview process, what makes a good design good? And while most of the answers are predictable and some of them are right, um, they all sound something kind of like this, uh, simplicity or a good use of space. Uh, or my personal favorite is this last one, when you can't remove anything else. Um, now those are, are good things. They're not bad things, but they aren't necessarily what make a design good. Uh, certainly not in the eyes of business and probably not for user experience either. Um, but what's more is that I don't think designers learned these catchphrases in art school. I think they picked them up from a pop culture, social media design phenomenon where UX means something that looks as cool as an iPhone. So, we're here today because designers are really terrible at explaining design to other people that don't have the same level of knowledge and vocabulary design that we do, and yet we live in a world where the most articulate person usually wins. So the right answer to that question is that a design is good when it solves a problem, right? Whatever that problem is, business goals, usability, conversion, engagement, whatever the problem is, a good design solves it. And the difference between a good designer and a great designer is, there, is in their ability to not only solve those problems, but then articulate to someone else how their solution solves it. And if you can do that, then I'd say you're a great designer. Actually, I think there are three things that, that you and, and your designs need in order to be successful. The first one I already mentioned, it has to solve a problem, right? The second one, which most people also tend to understand, is that it has to be easy for users. If we're really practicing a user-centered design approach, then naturally we have to take into account the needs and expectations of the people who are actually using our products. But this last one, supported by everyone, I think is, is overlooked, um, maybe even misunderstood, and it certainly isn't taught in school, because if we don't have the support from everyone that we, that, that we need to be successful, then our projects will never see the light of day. You see, it's not enough to have a design that only solves a problem and is easy for users because if not everyone is behind us, we're gonna constantly rehash the same discussions and never get anywhere. You end up having those same conversations over and over again. The project scope slowly increases. You can't go as fast as you need to. And you maybe end up shipping a product with a compromised user experience all because you couldn't fin that off. So we've gotta be able to create an environment where everyone understands what we're doing so that we can move on to the next thing. So in that sense, um, being a great designer is just as much about your communication skills as it is about your design chops. Because you can have the most innovative design in the world, but if no one understands what you're doing, then it's not gonna go anywhere. You have to understand your decisions, articulate them to someone else that may not have that same depth of knowledge and technology or design that you do. And in fact, there's tons of books and blog posts written on the topic about how being articulate in general will make you successful in life. But for our time together today, I want to help us find some better ways of explaining our design decisions for the purpose of convincing people that we can be trusted with the solution. Well, why is this important? And if designers are the experts, then why should we have to explain ourselves to non-designers, people who don't have that expertise? Well, it's because we're not the only ones with a stake in our project, right? Rarely are we the ones to make the final decisions for our apps or for our designs. 
And UX has gone mainstream, right? Today, more people in the organization than ever before are interested in UX. Product managers, marketing teams, engineers, they're all talking about UX. CEOs who previously had no interest in design are now intimately involved in the process because they understand that it, it presents a competitive advantage in a, in a challenging marketplace. Not only that, but everyone has apps that they use, that they love, or that they hate, and so they all are gonna have ideas about how they think it should be designed. And as the expert, you have to convince them that your designs have a rational explanation, that there, there is logic behind your reasons, if only you can communicate that to someone else. Now, UX technically already demands that we have an explanation for everything we do, right? Every button, every color, every choice, it has a purpose. The problem is that so many designers make a lot of decisions based on their intuition. Now, their intuition could be spot on, it could be absolutely the right thing to do, but it's not enough to win people over when they disagree with you. So because of this, we see things like the CEO button. The CEO button is an unusual or otherwise unexpected request from an executive to add a feature that completely destroys the balance of a project and undermines the very purpose of a designer's existence. Yet, this kind of thing happens all the time, right? You could spend weeks or months on a project pouring in all the best practices that you learned at all the students of UXD uh, events, and yet one executive could come in and blow up everything. So we wanna try to avoid this. I also see this a lot, the homepage syndrome. The homepage syndrome is a condition whereby the home screen of an application or website becomes a catch-all for everything, creating a garage sale of links, buttons, and banner ads that unravels the fabric of usability, causing designers to cry themselves to sleep. Sometimes it seems like no matter how hard you try, the homepage just becomes this huge mess. It's like something doesn't exist if it isn't exposed on the homepage, right? And we've got to learn to deal with this phenomenon. So to do that, I want to walk you through the process of meeting with a client or a stakeholder or an internal partner uh, and talking about our designs with them. And as we walk through that process, I'll give you some really practical things that you can do to learn to talk about your designs in a way um, that's more effective. But first, let's take a step back in the process to the very first time that you designed some sort of UI or interface control. You need to make yourself consciously aware of every decision that you're making, all those small moves for how you got from point A to point B. And you can do that, I think, by answering these three questions. What problem does this solve? How does it affect the user? And then why is it better than the alternative? Now you may have noticed these line up perfectly with the three things I told you you needed to be successful with the design, right? You need to solve a problem. It needs to be easy for the users. But this last question is really imperative because it's going to help us bridge that gap to get the support that we need to be able to move forward. And that's the answer to the question, why is it better than the alternative? Now, implicit in that question is that we know what some of the alternatives are. We maybe have even tried them and hopefully we're prepared to talk to someone about them. But therein lies the distinct difference in being able to help someone understand why we did what we did. It's explaining to them why our suggested solution is better than all the other alternatives that are out there. This should be your approach to everything you design. Next, you really need to work hard to understand the people that you're dealing with. So as you work with uh, people that have influence over your project, you've got to listen to them, uh, and listen to hear what they say, try to consider how they're responding to your work. Are they defensive? Are they supportive? Do they seem open to new ideas or are they a little ter territorial? Are they bored? Are they excited? Right? Over time, you'll figure out what's important and how you need to approach them. But you need, you need to find a way to talk to them. And the, the secret is that many people provide the same kinds of feedback at every single meeting. So you should be able to develop an approach uh, to see their perspective that will help you in subsequent meetings as well. Uh, next, a lot of people are easily distracted by stuff that just doesn't matter at all, right? Sometimes they can be so distracted by one thing that they'll identify a different, completely unrelated problem or be unable to discuss the real issues, right? A common example is with the use of like color or placeholder content. Um, I've seen it happen dozens of times where someone is so distracted by my use of lorem ipsum copy that they can't seem to move past it to actually kind of get to the usability and effectiveness of the application. So figure out what those distractions are and try to remove them so that you'll be able to focus on the real issues. 
um, one of the stakeholders that I, I worked with on a project really loved the left panel that Axure generates in its prototypes for navigating all the pages. If you're familiar with Axure, then you know exactly what this panel looks like. This was an older version of Axure that didn't enable me to remove that left panel. It was always exposed by default. The newer versions, they fix that. You can check a box and it'll remove that. But she loved it so much that she would comment on it every week during our calls. And finally, at one meeting, she actually said, you know what, I think we need to use that for our navigation. Now, I didn't really respond to her in the moment of the meeting. I kind of just let, let that die. But instead, after that, I began sending her the links directly to the individual HTML files that she would need so that that left panel would be removed. And you know what, she never brought it up again. So then based on what you know about the people that you're working with, you should be able to guess how some of them are going to react. So go through your designs. Try to figure out what the pain points are that you think are going to come up. Make notes on them. Be prepared to defend your decisions. Okay, I know Alex is going to ask me why I chose this icon when we talked about a different one. right? So I have notes. I'm prepared to talk about that. Sometimes just knowing what to expect can go a really long way in helping you be well-spoken in the moment of a meeting. So the next step is, is listening. Now that you've prepared yourself to present your designs, you've anticipated how they might react, you actually have the opportunity to meet with them face to face, the people who have influence over your project that may or may not approve your work. Now, listening is an important skill for any relationship, obviously, but for the purpose of going over designs with a non-designer stakeholder, a few simple things for a uh, few, few simple tactics for listening to design feedback that I think will um, be useful. The first one here is to let them talk as much as they want uh, without interrupting them. People really like to hear themselves talk and sometimes people just want to sound smart to others in the room. Um, other people might eventually explain your design to themselves without you having to say anything at all. But whatever it is, let them say what they need to say before moving on. You can make notes of the individual items so you can go back over them afterwards. But then next, try to hear then what they're not saying. And this is an important part of the process because sometimes what people say they want and what they actually need can be two different things. Uh, Peter Drucker, who wrote uh, several classic books on management and listening, said this, the most important thing in communication is to hear what isn't being said. Um, I, I worked on a, an application once where there was a, a, a section where choosing a category in, in the left-hand view here um, broke out the form into a completely new view that you see here on the right-hand side. So the user would enter information for a patient. Uh, they would choose the category and they'd be taken to the correct form to enter the data for that case in this separate view. So when my client saw that the form didn't allow her to edit that patient information in that second step, the, the information she just entered, it, it was displayed at the top of the view instead. She said, oh, well, we need to allow the user to change the patient information from this view, independent of the records that are in the database. And that kind of struck me as a really odd request. So I questioned on her in this, you know, why, why would you want to change the information that you just entered? And she had this response that had something to do with a paper form that she was used to filling out for the Food and Drug Administration, a government body in, in the United States. Um, and she didn't want to have to train people, but the patient information was already entered on the first screen. And... Sometimes you'd want a different address than what was already in the database. I mean, it was crazy talk. It, not only did it not make sense, but it was obviously a bad practice to have duplicate or conflicting data for the same person. And it would have made the interface a lot more complicated. Well, we had several revisions and meetings where she just continued to insist, oh, we have to allow the user to independently edit this patient data on the second view. Finally, I began to realize that she saw this second view as sort of a digital version of that paper form she'd referenced earlier. And from her perspective, the app needed to mirror that paper form one-to-one, -one, the, the, the thing that she was accustomed to using. That was her mental model for how she saw this piece of software. Now, I had designed it to be similar to that form on purpose, but she was distracted by some of the differences that she saw. So our solution was pretty simple. It was to just redesign the form and keep the data entry on that same first view uh, where the patient information had already been entered. Um, but then when they selected the form, we would just use JavaScript to load it down below. So we would keep the user actually in context. So when she saw these changes, she agreed and all the other issues that she had about the FDA form and duplicate data and training people, that all kind of disappears. So, so you see, what she told me she wanted was very different from what she actually needed. 
So during the course of listening to the people that you're working with, you have to work really hard to try to uncover the real problem they're trying to solve. Often they see a need that isn't being met with your design and they may express it with a suggestion that isn't the right solution at all. So don't focus on what they think needs to change, but instead on the underlying problem that they may want to solve. And, and if you're not sure, it's okay to just ask them directly, what problem are you trying to solve by suggesting this? I ask this of my clients and business partners frequently. What problem are you trying to solve? It's also important to get uh, your clients and your, your stakeholders to move from talk, telling you what they like or what they don't like, which is just their preferences, to what works and what doesn't work, which speaks more to the usability or the functionality of the software. It's just too easy for everyone to say that they don't like something. And I think we need to teach non-designers to focus more on the function and the usability of our software and the needs of the user rather than what they themselves prefer. So you can ask them questions like, well, what doesn't work about this, right? Or I understand you prefer that this be moved over here, but why doesn't it work to have it over there? And sometimes people will just catch themselves and be like, oh, it totally works. I just want to have it over here, right? And they realize in that moment that they're just expressing their own preference. And then lastly, if you're really having trouble understanding the, the suggestions that people are making, you can ask for examples or reference material of other apps that already do what they're describing. People almost always have uh, other apps that they're thinking of. Now, that doesn't mean that you have to do it that way because that's how Facebook does it, right? But it can help you understand how they see it and approach the problem. Um, once I was working with a client who asked me to change the order of some uh, form inputs. Um, when I asked uh, for an example of an application that did it that way, she sent me the Excel spreadsheet that she used to enter the data or, or, or as she, that she got as a, uh, an export of, of the data from the system. Now, she didn't want it to look like an Excel spreadsheet. She, she knew that wasn't appropriate. But that was her frame of reference for how she saw the data. And it turns out she was concerned that the exported version of the data that she would get um, would it be the columns wouldn't be in the same order and it turns out she was accustomed to getting this dump of the database and using it in presentations with executives um, and she had no idea that how it was presented in the application was completely independent of the way the data would be presented when she got it out of the database but knowing this allowed me to see better how to respond to her uh, in that moment so once you've had sufficient time to kind of understand to listen to their feedback now it's time for you to form a response. But before you do that, you need to really have the right attitude, right? To help you get what you want, to get in the right frame of mind. And I think there are two things here that are gonna help you prepare to respond. Um, if you're familiar with 12-step uh, programs that help people overcome addiction, then I'd say that this uh, first step here is true for us. The first step to recovery uh, is admitting that you're not in control. No matter what we think, uh, we don't usually have a final say in all our design decisions. There are other people involved, whether it's a team or an executive, right? And the, the sooner you realize this, the sooner you learn to kind of let go of that, you'll see how important it is for you to learn to influence people with your intellect, with your words. You can't force them to agree with you. You, you literally have no choice but to find a better way. And then no matter what you think of their suggestions and their feedback, always lead with a yes. Now this means quite literally to start every response with the word yes, with a positive reinforcement and validation of that person's feedback. No one likes negativity and people, especially not your boss or your client, are gonna wanna hear no is the first thing out of your mouth, right? Now, leading with a yes doesn't mean doing anything and everything they say, okay? It simply means to remain positive, to take that posture of agreement, to reinforce you both on the same team, to remind them of the areas where you do agree before you get to the parts where you don't. So let's say you disagree with what they're suggesting, but you do understand the problem they're trying to solve. In that case, leading with a yes might sound like, yes, we can definitely solve that problem. Or yes, I agree with you that we need to reconsider this UI control. Right? Taking that approach will create trust and it shows that you're taking their suggestion and, and their advice seriously. Um, recently, I was meeting with uh, a CEO and, and he started making suggestions for like one particular interface control, throwing out different ideas, uh, making really nitpicky suggestions about the placement and the color. And I said that exact same thing. I said, yes, I agree with you that we need to reconsider this. And at that moment, he stopped almost abruptly and said, great, I know you guys will figure out the best way to handle it. You see, he didn't really want to get into those details. He, he knew that that wasn't his job. 
He wanted to know we were listening to and considering his feedback. And after that, he trusted us. But leading with a yes also often means finding a way to say no while actually leading with a yes, right? Perhaps your suggestion is gonna make more time than your team has. Maybe it's gonna cost more money. It could mean that the project scope has to change, right? Whatever it is, there's some trade off and you can find a way to lead with the yes when you know that they may not be willing to accept that trade off. Yes, that's a great idea. If we're gonna do that, it's gonna push back the release by a couple of weeks. But mostly leading with the yes is just meant to foster that atmosphere of collaboration where each person respects the ideas and suggestions of others. You'll, you'll be amazed at how much easier it is to get what you want when you stay positive and you make the other person feel good about their suggestions. All right, so now that you're in the right frame of mind, let's go through some specific tactics to help you respond. Um, one way to respond is to appeal to a nobler motive. This is actually one of the steps of communication from Dale Carnegie's 1936 classic book, How to Win Friends and Influence People. If you've not read it, I highly recommend it. Um, and I find that this, uh, th this method can be especially relevant in, in software and application design because with any piece of software, we, we always have a set of goals or use cases or design standards that we've already agreed upon. And often one person's bad idea has more to do with their own preferences or they simply aren't thinking about the original goals. It's just their knee-jerk reaction, right? So in that case, you want to bring those goals and use cases back as the thing you're both trying to achieve, right? Sometimes the thing you get stuck on is just distracting you from that. So in that case, appealing to a nobler motive might sound like, yes, I agree this UI control isn't ideal, but whether or not we decide on that right now isn't going to help us accomplish this goal. So let's keep going. Let's move on, right? If you're ever able to make your case by point of that previously agreed upon motive, then you're more likely to convince the other person to move forward with your recommendations. Another good way of helping people see the difference between your recommended design and their suggestion is simply just to compare the two side by side. I've successfully done this many times where I take both designs and kind of put them on the same image, uh, split screen. Um, Often they can instantly see uh, the, the reasons why uh, what I was recommending would be more effective. Uh, I was working on a mobile app a long time ago uh, with, uh, that had a two horizontal levels of navigation, one below the other. As you see here on the left, the, the one at the top is in red and the, the one below it is in gray. But one of our design goals for this project was to fit as much content as possible uh, in the vertical browser space. In this case, it was news headlines. And that two level navigation took up too much vertical space. So I redesigned it in the, in the mock up on the right by putting uh, the, the options from that gray menu into a, into a drop down. Now, this allowed me to use one horizontal menu and then it gave more space for an average of about two headlines uh, per page. But my client didn't buy it. He said, oh, we need to show all the options all the time. Otherwise, people aren't going to know what they can and can't filter on, right? But I knew that nobler motive. I knew that vertical space had more value to him than exposing those filters 100% of the time. And showing it to him like this side by side made it clear what our choice should be. So uh, another tactic then is to offer an alternate solution that either you know, meets them halfway or even better, solves the problem uh, in a better way for them. Sometimes people will just say, oh, put, you know, put a big button right here that does this, right? So instead of adding that button, find a better place to put that element. And sometimes, I'll admit, when you're in the moment of a meeting, you may have to come up with a less than ideal alternative solution on the spot. But any alternative you propose is going to create a conversation that there are more ways to solve this and it might buy you some time so that you can go back and find the best way to solve it so always be prepared to propose that alternative another one is to give them a choice right they have to make some sacrifice they have to understand the trade-offs this this is especially effective if the thing that they'll lose is more important than the thing that they'll gain which is you know we, if we can present it that way that's a really effective way of doing it for example you know if we add this button here then we have to move the login form down further or you know adding that is going to require more time so we won't be able to launch with the dashboard graphs that you wanted so not only does this allow them to see their request in light of the other priorities, but it also lets them participate in making that decision. And anytime you can allow someone else to agree with you in a way that makes it seem like it was their idea, you should definitely do it that way. And then finally, before you make any decisions that you think are going to negatively impact your design, 
just propose postponing the decision until another time. That could be in as little as just a few hours or a few days, depending on kind of the cycle of your meetings and deadlines and whatnot, right? Just enough time to allow you to regroup so that you're not making decisions right there on the spot. And you can ask for more time by leading with a yes. Yes, I see your point and we really need to find the right solution. How about I spend the next hour or so working on it and we can come back again to discuss it. Whatever it takes to give you the time you need to respond appropriately. I actually did this once in an hour long meeting where in the first 10 or 15 minutes, I realized that, that this uh, kind of mob mentality and group think was gonna take us to a really bad place. And I said, you know what? Meeting adjourned. Like this isn't what I expected to solve for, but I do wanna come up with the right solution. Everyone just go back to your desks. I'm gonna stay behind in the conference room and you can come back in about a half hour. And, and that gave me the opportunity to kind of manage that conversation better so that my expertise kind of remained the center of the conversation. And I had more kind of capacity to come up with a better solution than what, I, what any of us would have just Googled at the conference room table in that moment. All right, so while every project is different and all of my you know, clients and internal business partners have unique needs, um, I have found that there are some ways of explaining my designs that seem to just, I, I seem to reuse them over and over again. So I've written them down for my own benefit. I'm happy to share them with you and you can kind of put them in your back pocket. Maybe they'll be useful for you. There may be some that, 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 you, don't, that, that you don't see here that you use on a regular basis. The value here is that we don't have to reinvent the wheel every time, right? If you find yourself saying the same kinds of things, make it easier on yourself. Document it, write it down, have those kind of catchphrases available so that you know how to talk about your work uh, in the moment of the meeting. But let's go through uh, some of mine here. One is that it facilitates a primary use case, right? Anytime uh, you can connect your design decision to the main use case or secondary case of the application, then you're gonna stand, this is a good chance that you'll convince someone of your decisions, right? It could be that it follows a common design pattern. Um, you know, users get accustomed to standard layouts. You know, muscle memory is going to help them navigate our software. Taking advantage of those patterns is a bonus. I'm not sure most non-designers are really acutely aware of the concept of, of patterns in design. And that's an opportunity for us to help educate them and advocate for our practice as well. Um, it could meet a particular goal, right? Just like the use cases, if your decisions can be directly connected to a goal, you'll be making a good case for your design. This might be that nobler motto that you can point to and say, hey, if we do it this way, it's gonna help us accomplish that goal. Um, it could be that the data supports it, right? Maybe we have research, we could have analytics. Hopefully everything that you're designing has some form of, of data, even third-party data to support your decisions. Um, and that's a pretty easy one to bring to the conversation and demonstrate why we did what we did. Um, it could be that it complies uh, with the standard that we, we may have limitations uh, in, in why we designed something the way that we did. For me, uh, on the web in particular, the most common one is you know, accessibility, right? Accessibility is going to prevent us from making certain choices that we otherwise would because we want our applications to, to be available and accessible to a wider audience of people. Um, we could have limits by you know, technology or even you know, time, money, resources, right? Our designs naturally have to take into account the limitations and programs on us. Every design has constraints and we need to be able to talk to our stakeholders, right? I, I worked with uh, a guy once who wanted to use the device camera in, uh, in a web application in the browser, but at the time browser support for accessing the camera directly on the device wasn't quite reliable, so we, we were able to defer that conversation, right? So anything you can do to kind of bring those limitations and constraints to light will help you manage that conversation. Um, it could be that it uh, draws the user's attention, right? Important elements need to stick out, right? If your design is helping the user know where to go or what to do, how they get from point A to point B, you can point that out. And similarly, it could be that it creates a flow for the user. We spend a, we spend a lot of time uh, creating the flow of an application, right? Don't let your clients or stakeholders' whims disrupt the flow of the user just because of their knee-jerk reaction to your work. Um, and then this last one is less important for me for, for UX uh, overall, um, but I do sometimes find myself defending you know, specific colors or fonts or interface designs because branding standards, right? These are, these are the standards that were established for the application or for the, for the company or for the project. And so we, we have to use uh, those, those standards. Okay, so before we wrap up here, I wanna go back to the three questions that I posed at the beginning because it's important to emphasize that all throughout this conversation, you're going back to your answers to these three questions. And you're using them to inform how you apply the, the tactics and the advice here, right? You need to understand how to answer these questions first to yourself so you can be better prepared to answer them to someone else 
in the moment of the meeting. How is this going to affect our user or our customer? What problem are we really solving? And then lastly, uh, why is it better than the alternative? So before we finish, I want to be honest and say uh, sometimes, despite your best efforts, uh, you'll still be forced to make changes to your project that you completely disagree with. Um, but I'd like to share a story with you that is shady at best and not downright deceptive at worst, but it can work really well. The truth is the world is full of unreasonable people who will want what they want, no matter what you think, and sometimes to the detriment of the user experience. You see, some people just want to give feedback, maybe even if they don't have any feedback to give at all. Why? That's the purpose of the meeting, right? If they had nothing to say, there'd be no point in us getting together, would there? Right? Other people, like I said, maybe they just want to sound smart. Right? It's as if they wouldn't be getting their money's worth of our time if everything we did was just great. Right? What's the point of having this meeting about designs if I don't have feedback to provide? Um, and so it was for these people that I want to share a story with you uh, called Painting a Duck. Now, the story goes that there was a 3D digital designer in Silicon Valley, a Silicon Valley gaming company who was tired of all the changes uh, that his client was making to his work. And it seemed like no matter what he did, they always had one more change. So when it came time to design the animations for the, the queen in a, in a chess game, um, he made all the changes that his stakeholder requested. Um, but with one addition, he gave the queen a pet duck. And he was sure to have the duck kind of flapping and quacking annoyingly around the, around the queen's feet. And instead of having to sacrifice some part of it that he really loved, he added that duck as a purposeful distraction for his client. What he found was that uh, they came in, they looked at it and said, it all looks very, very good, but I don't like the duck. Remove the duck and we'll be done. The end. Um, all right, well, uh, as uh, they mentioned earlier, uh, my name is, is Tom. Um, I've personally been uh, designing uh, interfaces and leading design teams for nearly 20 years in a bunch of different environments on internal teams and a consulting company. I'm currently leading an internal team. Obviously, I wrote a book called Articulating Design Decisions. So while I use all this stuff on a daily basis, I'll confess, I don't always get my way with my designs because in addition to all of this, you also have to be willing to admit when you're wrong, right? You have to be open to the idea that other people may have better ideas than you. Uh, but still, I hope that you can take away some useful tips uh, to work into your daily work and that you'll be better prepared to articulate your design decisions, communicate with your stakeholders, keep your sanity, and still deliver the best user experience. Thank you. Amazing. Everyone, give Tom a round of applause or a clapping emoji um, as you can react. Oh my gosh, that was so helpful. I don't know about you all. Uh, Tom, thank you so much for uh, this wonderful presentation. I am really, really, really uh, happy that we get to like talk about these things because I feel like too, in as someone that goes to design school, like these kind of talks about being able to communicate like during critiques especially we kind of just do it without thinking about it if that makes sense and we don't actually stop to think about the different points that you made that are really important and should always be in you know the front of our minds whenever we're explaining our yeah. work thank you so much for that uh, yeah and, and if i if i may real quick i because i think you bring up an important point that the the critique skills and kind of process that you learn in school, it is not the same as working in an environment with people that aren't familiar with that process. Right. It's great for working on your teams, but you know, most formal design critiques have sort of the rules of engagement, right? There's a there's an understood process and everyone that you're participating in that critique with is on the same page about that about what that is. Mm -hmm. What you'll learn very quickly is that once you are get in the workforce and go to your first meeting, those people don't care about your stupid critique rules, right? They're they're, they're not going to sign on the dotted line about how exactly that conversation would go. Mm -hmm. They're going to say whatever they want to say and you're not going to be able to stop them, right? And figuring out how to manage that in the moment is really difficult to do. And it's something, quite frankly, that can be difficult to teach. And that's why I tried to kind of like summarize it in a succinct way here for, for you all. And hopefully that will, you know, kind of give you the, the, the tools that you need to, to be successful. For sure. 
I'm buying the book. Uh, <laughs> you're, I'm sold. Uh, and actually, uh, with that, we also have other questions um, that people have been asking throughout the the time that you were presenting. So I'm going to go ahead and go over those. And everyone that's in the chat still, if you have any more questions, the students of UXD team are going to be going through uh, and adding those in. So make sure uh, that you do ask any questions that you have. But first we're going to go with Stacy. And Stacy asks, how do you communicate uh, with stake with stakeholders um, without, I believe, without saying it is my gut feeling that dot 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 when you articulate that the design decision is based on this principle or that best practice, um, which is in direct contradiction to that gut feeling. Um, so your gut feeling, your intuition, as I described it earlier in the presentation, should not be used as a justification for your design decisions. Now, my guess, my gut feeling <laughs> is that is that that gut feeling in you is based on some prior knowledge and understanding of those best practices. Mm -hmm. And that's the challenge is that you can't go into that conversation blind and just go, okay, this is what feels right to me. If that's what you're taking to that conversation, then you're already doing it wrong. Figure out what makes that feel right. There is an explanation. You just have to dig deep. And certainly answering uh, the, the, the big three questions, making sure you understand how you're solving the problem and making it easier, um, right? And then, you know, understanding why is it better than the alternative. Those are going to help you. But it's been my experience that when I feel like it's intuition, there's actually some prior experience that I had. I read an article about something, there was a class I took, I built an app once that did this and it didn't work that way, right? Figure out what those things are so that you can bring your experience to the table as opposed to just simply a gut feeling. It is more appropriate, by the way, I think to say, in my experience, this right. is gonna work better than that. And, it, and then if you're able to like justify that with a list of reasons or share your experience, that'll be really helpful as well. Right, and Stacy actually um, clarified too, if it, it's not their gut feeling, uh, specifically, but it's the stakeholder who is saying it's their gut feeling. But I think your your response still answered the same question, where it's where you can respond. You know, as a designer, in my experience, you know, you're you're using your experience um, to your advantage, right, Tom? Yeah, absolutely. So the answer is going to be the same, kind of regardless of the individual using their gut feeling. The difference, I think, in what Stacy is clarifying is you then need to help that stakeholder understand. Okay, what's at the bottom of their gut like? They, they had another experience that is also speaking into that, right? So figure out, we, now we have to start asking questions about well, why is this this way? Why doesn't this work? Where have you seen this work or not work, right? We have to start probing to kind of uncover their thinking as well. Right, for sure. And that makes a lot of sense because I feel like if we are, if we have the responsibility to articulate why, they should also have the, um, you know, ability to say why they think you know, something should be the way it is, you know? Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, and uh, Vikas, Vikas uh, says, how can we articulate design to a business person insisting the pros and cons of any design? Um, that question, honestly, is, is a little bit vague because it's hard to understand exactly what pros and cons of any design are. So I'll, I'll say this. You have to tailor your message to the audience that you're delivering it to. If I'm meeting with a business person, then I'm more apt to use language that I know is going to appeal to that person. I'm less likely to use design jargon and, and, and words of, about you know, the white space. They don't care about white space, right? I am more inclined then to try to directly attach my design decisions to a business goal or to some business terminology or metaphor that they understand. Um, and you have to be able to do that. And, and a business person is certainly one example. If you're meeting with a, a product person or with an engineer, then your message might change slightly. So you, you, part of it is tailoring that message, understanding the person that you're dealing with and delivering a message message, not that you would deliver to yourself, right? And I think this is the trap we fall into. We go into these conversations explaining in a way that, it, that makes sense to us, right. but we have to explain it in a way that makes sense to them. Right. It's like we're the uh, Rosetta Stones of, of the decisions that are being made. Absolutely. That, that's not an inappropriate way to describe it. I often talk about um, 
this process as like solving a Rubik's cube for multiple different like parties, right? Because what happens is someone's gonna come in and say, hey, I want my side to be red. If you just turn this here, then my side will be red and I'll be happy. And we have to be attuned to kind of all the other parts and pieces of you know, the engineering and product and business and kind of understand how it all works so that we can be that translation piece and say, yes, I love red too. I, I want your side to be red, but when I turn this here, it affects the other sides and I have to solve for the whole cube, right? And you can't, you can't do that if you don't understand those connections and are able to communicate them to someone else. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and to that point, uh, Vicky actually asks, how do you uh, convince CEOs or stakeholders nicely, um, even if you're being the translator, nicely that we're designing um, for the users and not for them necessarily. Yeah, I mean, that's a common challenge that uh, you know, a lot of people see themselves you know, as a user. They're a human, they have a perspective on, on the design. They may even have some specific domain knowledge that is informing like what they're bringing to the table. So there's kind of two sides to this. One is that, yeah, we absolutely have to educate them and help them understand that they aren't the user, that there really is no typical or average user. Everyone is different. And until we see people use it, until we're actually showing it to real people and seeing how they react, then it's just my opinion against yours, right? And that's, that's not an objective or good way to make serious business decisions. And I think any business person would be would appreciate the opportunity to, to make a good objective decision as opposed to just going off whatever, you know, he thinks versus what she thinks, right? So that's kind of the first part of it. The second part of it is that it is true that there is often some very valuable domain or expert knowledge that is informing their choices and how they're bringing it to. So we can't discount that either. We also have to try to uncover that in the process as well. Maybe there's not, maybe it really is just their subjective opinion and we have to make that call, um, but we, we, we can't, write it off at the outset. We need to work hard to make sure that there isn't some gold mine of information there that we're missing because stakeholders inherently, if, if we think we have a difficult time talking about design to other people, they really have a difficult time because they don't know design. They literally don't understand the vocabulary. And so that is part of our job is to not just explain it to them in a way that's compelling and, and to them, but then to help them explain it back to us in a way that's going to help us understand where they're coming from. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And I think too that um, one of Stacy's questions does connect to this because, you know, one of those things or reasoning that you could use is usability testing, right? And I think that um, what Stacy's asking is uh, how do you communicate that, you know, this usability testing shows whatever and the stakeholder is still insistent? Um, that they want to be, uh, the, they want the design to be changed to accommodate, accommodate their direct design tasks. So like, I guess right. it's more of just the conversation of prioritization and, you know, how do you kind of navigate that with a stakeholder? Sure. I, I mean, there's a number of different ways. One of them I, I mentioned in the presentation, which is helping them understand the trade-offs. You know, what are, what are the risks um, what are we exposing ourselves to by just doing what we think versus what we're seeing in, in usability testing, right? I, I think it's appropriate to document that and bring that to them and help them understand like, can we do what you're asking us to do? Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Should we? I don't think so. Like for in my expert opinion and from what I'm seeing in the user testing, that is not going to help us accomplish the goal that we set. If you insist that we do that, fine, we'll document it, we'll write it down, we'll keep an eye on it and then let's touch base again in two months and see how it is, right? I, I've done I've done that with stakeholders who insisted on doing something that I felt to be detrimental. But then you have to you have to have some way of measuring it uh, once it's in production, right? Um, I mean, you know, A/B testing is an easy one to to get through, you know thrown around. There there are obviously you know kind of some implications to that in terms of you know you can A/B test everything to to death, but it, it, in certain cases that would be an appropriate way to move forward is to do a, a, an A/B test. But like at the end of the day we have to decide who's more accountable to these decisions. Is it us or is it our stakeholder? And we have to learn to be able to build trust with them. Sometimes it's okay and we need to feel okay making a decision uh, based on what our stakeholders are telling us to do simply because we need to build that trust going forward. And I think if we're, if we're writing stuff down and making sure that they're 
that it's crystal clear what our recommendation is, but we're, you know, we're still going to accommodate them and we can track that and keep that conversation going, then we will build that trust even if it turns out that decision was wrong later. Right. Yeah. And yeah, that that's really interesting because just to put into, I guess, in a student's context, right now we're not necessarily dealing with stakeholders and instead we're more just trying to find best ways to, you know, present these decisions like on our portfolios. And I'm curious to know, um, while you're talking, I was thinking about like, how do we best articulate our articulation of design decisions without being too overwhelming? Because I know that, you know, some, some things that people are, or students um, also kind of struggle with is, you know, brevity um, and being straight to the point, knowing that, you know, uh, recruiters are only looking at portfolios for a very short amount of time. Is there kind of like any type of advice that you would have uh, as someone who has been you know, focusing on articulating design decisions and everything. In, in terms of what students can put in their portfolio to demonstrate yeah. that? Yeah, because I think that there's a lot of things to cover and, you know, we want to be able to show that, you know, we're thinking of all these different things, but how do we do that in a way that's not too overwhelming or too wordy? Or like if you've, if you've seen good examples of that, if you, you know, have just anything that comes in your mind about that. Yeah. So, one part of articulating design decisions, and to use a school term, is showing your work, right? Um, that anytime you can enter into a conversation with a stakeholder and show them how you arrived at your decision, then you're going to make a better case. What, what's, what is a common problem is to show up and just to be like, ta-da, here it is. You know, you may have seen the meme that's like, you know, a good desi uh, design is like a joke. If you have to explain it, then it's not very good. Right. That's, that's totally <laughs> wrong. If your designs would, could speak for themselves, then this wouldn't be a, a thing at all. This wouldn't be an issue, right? Now, your designs won't speak for themselves. That responsibility lies with you, right? And so anytime you can help someone understand, right, here's where we started. These are the decisions that we made. This is the research we saw. This is a usability test I observed. And that we, are, we made these moves. We changed it again. And we arrived, like, Telling that story, showing your work is a really valuable way of doing that. And that's exactly the same kind of approach that you can take with something like a portfolio, right? Mm -hmm. is, that, is that often what I see in portfolios is the final result and some wordy description of what they did, right? right. I actually don't care as much about what you did. I care about why you did it. And if you can show me early sketches all the way through final design and then show me where you did something wrong and how you changed it and why you changed it, that's far more compelling than some glossy, pretty design with a big, you know, big company name on it that is intended to impress me. I want to understand your process and your thinking. I don't necessarily need to see the output. Right. Yeah. And uh, now we, we have a question from somebody um, that has had experience and Morella says, in my years of experience, I've come to find out that analogies work really well in reaching common ground with stakeholders and developers. What is your opinion about using analogies um, in explaining design decisions? Sure. Yeah, uh, analogies, metaphors. I mean, fundamentally, this is a communication problem, right? And any any tools that we can use to bridge the gap and the, in, in, the, in the differences in communication is going to be helpful. So yeah, absolutely. If there's a metaphor or an analogy, and, and in particular one that would connect it to that person's worldview, either their expertise in their, their business, right. um, then that can be really helpful. You know, if you can compare, you know, making this decision, I, I'm going to bot, I'm going to totally botch this and, and make it up on the spot. But if you're talking to some logistics person and you're like, you know, making a decision about the design in this meeting like this would be like hopping in a truck and not filling it with gas before you went on your route. I, I don't know. That's dumb. But, but any, anything you can do to help them understand the way we make decisions, like there, there is a process. We have to do things in order for a certain reason. And maybe there's a, a similar area that they they think about it in the same way sure that's absolutely going to be going to be helpful i think right that's a rosetta stone tool i i think uh now that we i think about it um yeah now this is an interesting question that we got from lucy and lucy says any advice for speaking with a stakeholder who makes a culturally insensitive comment during a group meeting is it better to speak with the person offline so as not to embarrass them and to sincerely appeal to their nobler intention if you 
think that they really didn't know they were offending anybody. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah. I, I think I, I tend to believe the best about people and, and their intentions and um, people, people make mistakes, stick their foot in their mouth all the time. Um, if someone were to do that in a, in a, in a meeting for me, I, yeah, I would, I would either talk to them individually myself and just let them, you know, let them know, or what's equally appropriate is to find a peer or a leader for them in the organization and let them know, hey, can you, you know, round out this conversation for us because some people were uncomfortable. Um, I think that's totally a, a appropriate. In my opinion, that's more appropriate than trying to call them out in, in the moment. But it's totally, it's going to completely depend on your relationship with that person. If it's someone I know really well, and if it's a really tight, close-knit team, it probably is appropriate to be like, dude, what do you... Why would you say that? That was stupid, right? Like, and if you have that kind of rapport with them, then sure. But I, in most work environments, it would probably be more appropriate to round that out after the meeting. Yeah. Nice. Yes, for sure. Um, and, you know, speaking of now, like teams are doing remote driven work, um, Arturo asks, what are some of your recommendations when you're not able to present in real time through meetings, maybe busy stakeholders, Zoom fatigue. Is it possible to articulate design decisions asynchronously? Yeah, absolutely. So I've been leading design teams remotely from, my, from this room here in Illinois uh, for about 10 years. And um, one of the things that I found to be really effective is to record a screen capture and webcam video, much like what we're doing now, where my face is in the corner and I have slides on the screen just like this. And it's usually pretty short. I try to keep these videos like five minutes. Two and a half minutes is like perfect for people's attention span if you can actually kind of get through it. Occasionally I've had videos be more like 10 or even 15 minutes, but it's, it's essentially my attempt to present to them asynchronously. And then I upload that video to Slack or unlisted on YouTube or whatever. Loom is a tool that enables this really well. A lot of organizations are using as well. I find that videos like that to be far, are far more effective than throwing a mock-up on Slack or, or, or Microsoft Teams or whatever, like when people don't have time, because people will just have a knee-jerk reaction to it, right? If I send an email with a big, long explanation and a link to a prototype, they're not going to have that context. They're not going to hear my tone. They're not going to see my body language or, or a short video. And it does, it, I practice it. I, I mean, I'll probably record it three or four times, right? So it's not like I get it right the first time. Like I, I practice it. I write a short script. I have my slides laid out. Like you, you want to make it, you want to make it worthwhile. Um, I find that to be far more effective use of, of people's time uh, than sending, you know, text or, or you know, email messages. So. Yeah, that makes total sense. And I'm hearing people like, that's so smart. I've never heard that before um, from Lucy. So that's really, that's really great to learn from you. Um, and we have two more questions and then we can go ahead and wrap up. But Marina asks, I've been hearing from POs and tech people that we should not quote sweat design decisions. We should just do the simplest and basically and, and the simplest and basically first thing that comes into mind, deliver it and see if it works through user feedback. Um, how can we defend design work prior to user feedback? Um, yeah, it's definitely more difficult if you don't have any like objective way of measuring whether or not your design will work. So um, I have a few, a few kind of thoughts on that. And, it's, and, and it is that Yes, uh, the, the PO is right in the sense that they're, and, and, and again, we, if we try to understand the person who's saying this, think about it from a PO's perspective. What do they value more than the design? They value shipping, right? They value getting it in the hands of customers sooner. So if we can appeal to their needs while also getting what we want, then I think that looks like agreeing to move forward with a plan like that, while also in tandem attempting to get some deeper thought into the process. So if it were me in an environment like that, I would tell the PO, yeah, sure, of course, that, that makes total sense. Let's put something together, let's ship it, let's test it. In the meantime though, because that won't conceivably take a long time, my team and I are going to do a design sprint. We're going to do a design thinking workshop. We're going to take the time to do the deep thinking necessary because we, in addition to doing those short incremental deliveries that we have to do every few weeks in order to have jobs, we also need to have a greater vision for where we're going and we need to be always be thinking about both of those. So there is a constant tension between delivering in the day to day 
while also understanding how that day-to-day -day bubbles up to the greater vision of where we're going. But we have to have both. We have to have that greater vision and constantly be pointing to it and going, oh, that's where we're headed. And if we can make a decision here, then that is gonna inform the next iteration until we finally get to that greater vision. So you, you can't only do one or the other, you have to be able to, to find a way to balance the needs of both. And there's no doubt it's challenging. It's really, really hard, uh, but that, that's the job. So. Right. Yeah, for sure. I, it's, it's, it's being more, it's becoming more apparent to me that, you know, as designers, we're, it's our job to be aware and like, kind of like look at everything from like a bird's eye view. I don't know if that if that's why you have a bird on your, <laughs> your book cover, but you know, I see that. Um, but uh, I think, you know, now that we, you know, have this tool of your book, um, Matthew actually asked a really great question of, you know, if, is there a framework that you use to explain design? Um, yeah, to explain design, like for example, smart is specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, time bound, et cetera. Like, do you have um, something more specific to design? And, you know, maybe we can find that out by like reading your book, but that's a, a question that Matthew has and that's our one of our final yeah ones. no I'm, I'm familiar with smart and that, that, that's a good one I, I think that's that's really valuable um, in the book I propose a, a framework I call the ideal response mm -hmm. um, and each letter in the acrostic for ideal stands for you know uh, identify the problem uh, describe your solution empathize with the user and then appeal to the business um, and then the last one, which is L, is to lock in agreement. So the others we've already talked about, right? Identifying the problem, helping them understand your solution, empathizing with the user, appealing to the business, that's gonna be like, why is this better than the alternative? But it's that last one, the, the lock in agreement part that is really important because we can do all those other things right, but if we leave off that L and we fail to just ask them directly, do you agree? You know, Are we ready to move forward? We wanna be crystal clear that this is the decision that we're making. If we leave off that L, and all we have is an idea. Mm. Whoa. That's, my, that's like my mic drop moment. Anyway, uh, you mentioned the cards earlier. Um, that is actually, it is on the cards. Oh, nice. Um, awesome. And it's in the book, obviously. And, um, and that the, the, the downloadable version of the card, which maybe you'll yeah. share, uh, is also, it's also on there. So For sure. Um, well, that's great. And now this is our actual final question from Vivian. And Vivian asks, is, what's the best non-Amazon way to get your book? The no. best non, uh, you know, unfortunately, there's really not a better, uh, a better way to get it. If you have a local bookstore that you can go to and request it, I mean, it's available mm -hmm. anywhere. Anyone can get it. It's distributed widely. But no, even, even, um, even O'Reilly stopped selling them directly. And if you go to O'Reilly's website, it will send you to Amazon now. <laughs> so it's like almost the only way to get it, unfortunately. That's okay. And I mean, again, everyone, like, I'm sure that I, like, I learned a lot from this talk, so I can't imagine how much more I will be learning um, after reading the book. So, Tom, thank you so much. That was so wonderful. You answered all of those questions so thoughtfully and uh, articulated things very well. So um, thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for everyone that joined us today. And yeah, I, I think that this was such a helpful, helpful talk and we had such a great time hearing from you, Tom.